Welcome. We're going to see some good things in 1 Peter today. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to dig in here and see what he means about some of the things he said. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the word. Thank you for all that you've given. We pray that you, Lord, would be our teacher. Lead us in what we should say, how we should think, and the way we should take what is instructed here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we talked last time about 1 Peter 3 and verse 18. And when we talked about that, we said that Christ died, and we pointed out different things that, that were accomplished in that. He died for our sins. He died once for all. He died to bring us to God. He died in real life. His flesh and blood were, were, were torn and poured out for us. He was raised, not just an animated body, but fully alive in an active spiritual resurrection as well. So, verse 19, his spirit was active after his body was dead and buried. He accomplished some sort of ministering to the ancient ones who had been contained until that time. And then you get to verse 20. Here's what it says. That these spirits that he, that he proclaimed to, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah, during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Now, in this, he's saying that these in spirit that he spoke to had been witnesses of the ark building. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11, and verse 7, it says that Noah's building was his message. As he built that ark, it was him declaring God's judgment on, on the world, and he, he was letting them know what was coming. When you get here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, it talks about, and, and Peter's a great one for bringing up one thing and then going to something else. First of all, he says things that are loaded with meaning that you almost have to dig into to figure out. And then when, it, when he's saying one thing and it reminds me of something else he doesn't want you to miss, and he jumps over to that. So you kind of have to follow his trail as it meanders. So here he's... Uh, He's begun talking about, in the days of Noah, he said, these spirits who had seen him during the construction of the ark. These were a message for specific people at a specific time. It took Noah about 75 years to build the ark. That's about how long it, it was uh, in construction. So for that 75 years, Noah was proclaiming by the building, by following what God had told him, the message of judgment that was coming. Well, when Peter refers to the ark and the saving of the eight people who survived from that, they uh, were brought safely through it. Well, it seems to bring his mind to a truth that he sees illustrated here. Verse 21, corresponding to that, he's just referred to the eight people who were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who's at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven, after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. What it says, says here is corresponding to that, or, or in line with that, Peter's looking at the flood episode as a picture of what happens to a believer who follows the Lord faithfully. So he writes, okay, like what happened to those eight, baptism now saves you. Or in the same way that they were saved in coming through the flood waters, you are saved by coming through the waters of baptism. Now, some people grab this as baptism now saves you, so they automatically build a doctrine that says, if you're not baptized, you're not saved. But I, I have to point out, the thief on the cross was never baptized, and yet he went with Jesus into paradise. It's There's no work of righteousness which we have done that can save us. It's God who does the saving. But what does it mean here? Corresponding to that, corresponding to what Noah and his family went through, baptism now saves us. Well, let's look at it. The waters of the flood were not what saved Noah. The judgment of God was pictured in the water of the flood. The water of the flood was to punish those who were rebellious against him. What saved him was the fact that there was a place of safety provided by God that brought them through the judgment waters and out the other side. 
The water of baptism does not save us. The water of baptism is a picture of the judgment of sin. It's death. Romans 6.23 says this, The wages of sin is death. And Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we might walk in newness of life. And Paul again in Colossians 2 and verse 12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, verse 13 says, And when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. So the water of baptism corresponds to the water of the flood. The water was a terrible result of sin and rebellion. The flood that came and washed away those who had rebelled against God. Noah and his family were dead if not for the salvation provided by God. From what would have been the end, certain death that lets no one go. They were brought out of the other side of that judgment into new life, into a new place prepared for them. The very flood became a salvation story. In the same way, our baptism becomes a salvation story. We aren't left buried. We aren't with him in baptism, and that's where you stay. But we're brought out for a new, clean life that's in him. Back in 1 Peter 3, verse 21, Peter makes clear. He says, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of the dirt from the flesh. He said, it's not washing your outsides, that does it? It's not because you clean off what, how you got dirty on the outside, but rather it is to the appeal to God for a good conscience. You go through the act of baptism because you believe that God will clean you up spiritually. When you're saved, you believe what God has promised to do in your life. And so in obedience to him, you go through what is pictured with the burial and death and the resurrection to new life. Second Corinthians 517, in fact, says that if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation, a new kind of creature, different being than they had been going in before they were born again. So you come out of the water of baptism, just as Christ came out of the grave, just as Noah came out of the ark that saved them, having gone through the water, shown your trust in God who saves. You understand that? Having gone through the water, you demonstrate your trust in the Lord who saves us. And verse 21 goes on. It's an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's all through Jesus. We're raised triumphant from death. He's taken his rightful place at the Father's right hand. He's right now in the Holy of Holies of heaven, and the Father's given him all authority on every level. It goes through in verse 22 here, saying, who's at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers have been subjected to him. It's telling us, that Jesus has accomplished the work and in his and has now been given full authority to complete what was begun. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to do verses 18 through 23. Listen to what it says. I pray that the eyes of your heart will may be enlightened so that you'll know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of his, the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come, And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I'm going to read it again in just a minute, but listen to what Paul says we need to know. He says, I want you to know the hope. And by hope, he means the absolute assurance 
that keeps hope alive. You can trust in what Christ has done. And he, and it's it's worth depending on this hope of his calling you. He wants us to know the riches of the glory of the bounty of light and life that God has for us. He's a, we inherit this in him. He wants us to know the massive power beyond limit that he exercised for those who believe. And this hope and the riches and the power come about as he works with the same mighty strength that he used when he worked in the Messiah to raise him from the dead and to seat him at his right hand in heaven, far above every ruler, authority, power, dominion, or any other name that can be named, either in this age or in the age to come. There's no one higher than the Lord Jesus Christ right now. He has complete, total authority. Also, he has put all things under his feet and has made him head over everything for the church, which is his body, the full expression of him who fills all in all. If the body of Christ, the church, are living the way that he called us to do, we absolutely are the fulfillment of what Christ wants done here. We express him accurately when we walk in obedience, when we are fully and completely doing what he called us to do. And so it's an important thing. It's important to him. It's important to us. We want to be that. So Christ has paid the price, has taken his place as head and authority, and as the timing works out that will bring us to the place of entering into his very presence, in the meantime, there are things that we will need to go through, things that will be tough, things that will be hard to bear. And yet we have the strength that comes from him, the peace and the, the help that he can give that will keep us true and keep us strong in it. That idea that the church, it's the people, and we're not talking about church building, of course. We're talking about the people who are Christ's, who are the full expression of him who fills all creation. How are you doing in that? It's not because you're perfect but it's because you continually come back and submit to the Lord and honor him by saying, Lord, I understand it's all of you. And let me ever be showing you, submitted to you, doing what you want me to do. Show me how it's done. Let me walk with you. Let me go after you so that where you go, I will go. How you go, I will do. I want to be like you. That's what he's called us to do. And he's promised us and has given us the resource of the Holy Spirit that accomplishes what he intended. This is the Lord God. He's still working and he's still accomplishing what all we're talking about. There will come a time when we step into eternity and we'll find the end result of all this. But for right now, we look around us and things often don't make sense. Or you look around and you're getting grief and people are upset at you and you're not treating you right. and you, All the things that seem like life just doesn't add up. Well, it doesn't because we're not home yet and we're not done with what we're supposed to be doing. Keep after the Lord. Let him supply what you need to live for him. Humbly put yourself under his authority and keep hoping because the hope is the assurance of what's coming will be and that God is there and he will not let go of you or quit loving you or quit keeping you in the way you should go. This is good news. We are brought through the waters of baptism and it's a picture of how Noah and his family were brought through the waters of the flood. They came out from the other side. They came out to a new life in a brand new place that was prepared for them. That's what's coming up for us, too. Are you looking forward to it? I am. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for the word. Thanks for the promises. Thanks for what you've got planned for us. But in the meantime, in the right here and now, help us to walk with you, listen to you, pay attention in the direction you'd have us go, learn from your word, the instructions that you've given here, but to have the hope of your promise and your blessing constantly um, in our mind so that we don't forget, so that we don't try to go on our own strength and go on our own figuring it out. 
but we can listen to the Lord and be led by you and be taught in the way that we should go. Help. I say I need your guidance in everything that I do. I pray that you'll help us as a people submitted to the Lord to be learning constantly, to be going where you'd have us go, and to be ever more climbing into the depths of the riches and knowledge of God. Thank you for these opportunities. Praise your name. We love you and are thankful that you love us. Guide in your name. Amen. Keep on. We're not done yet. We're going to continue with First Peter next time, but there's some really fun stuff here. Think deeply on this. Read on, and uh, I'll talk to you again next time.